Item 10, consent agenda action items. Action, all matters listed under the consent agenda are considered by the board to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items prior to the time the board votes on the motion unless the members of the board, staff, or the public request specific items to be discussed and or removed. Time will be provided before the vote for clarification questions without removing an item from the consent agenda. Item 10A. Oh, no, I apologize. At this time, um, I would like to call on Trustee Young. Would, would you like to make the motion to approve the consent agenda? Trustee Young? You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. Okay. I move that we uh, approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Voice, will you second the motion? I will second that motion. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Young and seconded by Trustee Voice to approve the consent agenda as presented. Any questions? None. Roll call, please. Trustee Young? Aye. Trustee Thurston? Aye. Trustee Honeychurch? Aye. Trustee Martin? Aye. Trustee Voice? Aye. President Chapman? Aye. Trustee Cara? Aye. Student Trustee T? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12 non-consent agenda items, action items. Uh, the first item, item 12A is a resolution. Number 21 slash 22 dash 27, findings of the Board of Trustees of Solano Community College District of Continued Emergency. Trust, uh, no, President, Superintendent. Thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to say that while the COVID case numbers are declining in uh, Solano County, uh, we still have uh, positive cases popping up. Uh, we had a total of 163 COVID tests done between February 22nd through the 25th, and we had a total of four positive cases. Uh, at this time, um, the state of emergency continues. We are, have not received specific details about if or when the governor will lift that. And so what we're going to ask is that at each board meeting, we uh, put forward a resolution to allow us to continue to meet remotely um, until or unless uh, directed otherwise by the governor. Correct. Okay. Um, Trustee Karima, would you be willing to move for the approval of this item? Absolutely. I'm willing to move to item 12A. Thank you. And Trustee Thurston, would you be willing to second the motion? I second the motion. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Karima and seconded by Trustee... Uh, Thurston to approve resolution number 21 slash 22 dash 27 findings of the board of trustees of the Solano Community College District of Continued Emergency as presented. Discussion? Roll just call. To, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say just to clarify, you know, at this time that our, our next meeting on our March 16th is planned to be in person, correct? Mm -hmm. and, yes. and then, um, you know, I don't know if there's a great way for us to express consensus of when we are feeling like we, you know, that we are at a place to return. But um, I just wanted to express my my thoughts that um, if our the rest of our staff and and uh, organization is starting to return at this time, that you know we we look at continuing on after that. If as so long as it is not a a huge burden to staffing to manage a meeting uh, in person. Okay. Others may have. Welcome to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. And may come that we um, may end up uh, having a hybrid meeting. So, so called, we'll have to wait and see. But thank you for those comments, for that comment. Uh, roll call, please. Trustee Cara? Aye. Trustee Thurston? Aye. Trustee Voice? 
Aye. Trustee Honeychurch? Aye. Trustee Young? Aye. Student Trustee Teague? Aye. President Chapman? Aye. Aye. Trustee Martin? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12B, resignation to retire. And I'm gonna call on our human resource expert, Stella Bate. Thank you, President Chapman. Um, for our first two uh, retirees, I'm gonna to defer to VP Williams, who has some very nice comments that were composed by our math and science faculty to read. Thank you, Sal. Uh, President Chapman, members of the board, uh, I bring to you two faculty retirements this evening. It's not by coincidence that they both have the same last name. They are married and they are planning on leaving together. And we're sorry to see both of them go. So we have Joe Conrad in the math department and Kathy oh, no. Conrad in the chemistry department. Uh, faculty, some of their colleagues have submitted comments for them and I would like to take this opportunity to read those comments to the board. Uh, regarding Joe Conrad, who has 28 years of service in mathematics at Solano College, uh, his colleagues write, Joseph Conrad has led in many capacities here at Solano Community College, as well as statewide during his 28 years of service. As a faculty member of the mathematics department, his many years of thoughtful service have strengthened the direction of the mathematics department in relation to compliance with AB 705, and has enhanced many faculty's ability to deliver distance learning during our most recent need to transition to online course delivery. As an example of his leading by example, Joseph has served Solano Community College as interim Dean of Math and Science and chairman of the curriculum committee. Also outside of the college, Joseph has served his fellow mathematics faculty statewide as the president of the CMC3 organization of math educators in California. His strengths lie in his ability to listen, take in all the information, and come up with rational and actionable options for his team. His leadership and mathematics teaching will be missed. As for Kathy Conrad, uh, who has served eight years in the chemistry department, her colleagues write, Kathy's strong work ethic and willingness to use her gift of writing has been over and above what the chemistry faculty have praised. Teaching our students has always been her priority and with chemistry, the laboratories are a key to that learning. Kathy's efforts in this area are long lasting because the laboratory experiments our students do in chemistry have been either written by or edited by Kathy many times over. Also her work with curriculum, program review, and rubric creation shine because of her ability to express complicated concepts in ways that our students could digest and learn. She has assisted both full-time and adjunct faculty alike and her, ability, her leadership and ability to get things done with an eye on student learning will be missed. Uh, Vahid Eskandari and one of her colleagues writes, no words can explain how all of, uh, how the Conrads will be missed. For me in particular, Kathy will be missed the most because I've worked with her for many years. She's been a great colleague, friend, and a great support. I'm sure that I will ask uh, many questions for Kathy. I wish all three of you a happy, healthy retirement. There was another uh, adjunct who was retiring as well. Uh, John Hagashi, another faculty uh, chemistry uh, professor writes, I've had the pleasure of knowing Kathy for 25 plus years and I've always been impressed by her energy and drive. She's been driven to excel as a teacher, as a mother, as a leader. She drives and I have come along for the ride. She's been the driver, the mechanic, the planner, the owner and our guide. She's taken our department and program to success and excellence. I'm guessing that she will not ease into retirement but boldly drive into a full and bright future. Uh, Professor Maria Santiago writes, I don't know exactly what to write on behalf of Kathy, or what do people write for this occasion? There are so many documents we wrote over the years that Kathy had a key role in producing. Here is a list of lasting accomplishments. She converted the paper lab book into a digital top hat book for the Chemistry 10 course, which was truly amazing. She created videos for students to observe experiments. She created chemistry student learning outcomes and rubrics. She wrote uh, chemistry curriculum development in line with uh, CID and transfer requirements. She helped design the labs for the new 2700 building. She helped with lab inventory protocols. And of course, most importantly, her superb English writing skills. And finally, Karen Carr, uh, another chemistry faculty member says, Kathy, we will miss you immensely. You've been a great friend, a great colleague and a huge asset to our chemistry department. You have always been there to support each one of us. We will miss all our hallway conversations, office discussions, top hat discussions, chemistry potluck meetings, and all the good times we spent together. You've brought a great energy to our chemistry department, 
We appreciate all your efforts and thank you for being their best wishes. So uh, I will I'd like to say I, Kathy and Joe are both delightful people, wonderful student advocates. We will miss them greatly. Wow, such an honor, such beautiful words for both of them. And, and each are um, in the STEM field and we need more and more excellent uh, faculty members, especially in the sciences. And anyway, I was moved by the comments. Thank you Absolutely. for sharing. Well, uh, I have a comment to make. Yes. Okay, Joseph Conrad was in the division that I taught in at the college for 35 years and I was on the hiring committee. There are a lot of gyms at Salama College that are still there and they have retired. And Joseph Conrad is one of the private gyms that we need to lock up and keep him there <laughs> for other students who could, you know, students who could have him as a professor. Excellent. I'm sorry these, these people are retiring, but you got to go. You got to go. Mm. I wish you the best of luck in the future. Thank you. Trustee Voice. Thank you. I, I'll also share my, my fondness for the Conrads. Uh, I actually grew up in church with them, so they've known me since I was in diapers. <laughs> and so Ooh. I have a great fondness to, uh, for both of them. And uh, every time I see them, they bring me joy. Uh, yeah, especially at Kathy, when I first started um, teaching chemistry with the dual enrollment program here, I really wanted to make sure that my students got the good foundation to succeed in the college chemistry. And she was more than happy to collaborate with me and look at what the the standards are and what would be best to make sure that they're ready and and really make a seamless transition so our students are successful. I, I just, you know, her, her commitment to uh, student success in a really challenging subject uh, is, is amazing. Wow, wonderful. Good info. Okay, so um, I'm going to, with that, I'm going to ask- Trustee the Chapman, uh, Trustee Chapman. Yes. We, we have one more uh, employee who's retiring. Okay. Um, and I think uh, Mr. Lofton has some kind words to share about him. He was one of our custodial staff. Oh. Uh, thank you, Sal. Yes. Um, uh, Padusak Shrisung, also known as Noisy, uh, will be retiring. Uh, a, a number of the comments that we have from his supervisor and, and fellow custodian. He gets along with all of his coworkers, always eager to lend a hand to anyone who needs help. He loves animals, especially cats. You can sometimes see him feeding the cats around the campus, which I did not know. <laughs> the whole custodial crew and the entire facilities will miss him tremendously, but also happy to see him retire and pursue his love for traveling. Noisy is trustworthy, dependable. We can always count on him. Always love hearing him play old school music while he works. And another custodian, Taylor, writes, when I started at the college six years ago, Noisy was the first one to reach out and help me out with valuable information that I still use to this day. From that day forward, he encourages me and motivated me to do my best in and outside of work. And for all that, I will always be appreciative. He will truly be missed from all of us. And another writes, he will be missed. We will not forget him. He's done so much for everybody. It was a pleasure to work with Noisy. Very nice, very respectful man. He will be missed. Okay. Again, beautiful comments regarding... I'm getting feedback. Um, okay, thank you. Um, another employee, uh, Noisy, uh, my kind of guy who likes old, old school music and uh, evidently he kept uh, joy in the workplace. So another person that will be sorely missed. Um, so to make the motion, I'm going to call on Trustee Boyce, if you will make the uh, motion to move for the approval of item 12B, and then I would like Trustee Young to second the motion. Sure, I'll, I will make the motion to approve item uh, 12B, unless not making the motion makes some stay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Trustee Young. Trustee Young, 
Would you like to second the motion? You're muted. You're muted. Yeah, I'm muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Early, but the top of the screen now, I noticed they at the bottom of my screen. <laughs> All right, there. Right. Thank you. Okay, it was moved by Trustee Boyce and second by Trustee Young to approve the resignation to retire as presented. Any further discussion, comments? Seeing that roll call, please. Trustee Martin. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Young. Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. Trustee Thurston. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. Aye. Trustee Cara. Aye. Student Trustee Teague. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12C, District and International Union of Operating Engineers, Stationary Engineers, Local 39, 2021 through 2024 Collective Bargaining Agreement. Um, is that sale again? Okay, you got it. Thank you, uh, President Chapman and, and uh, board members. Uh, we have wrapped up our bargaining with Local 39 and we have bring forward a TA that meets the interests of uh, many interests expressed by both the district and the union. So we are presenting the TA for final ratification by the board. Hey, thank you. Um, Trustee Honeychurch, would you be willing to move for the approval of item 12C? Yes, I move for the approval of that item. And Trustee Martin, would you second the motion? I'll second 12C. It was moved by Trustee Honeychurch and second by Tr Trustee Martin to approve the District and International Union of Operating Engineers Stationary Engineers, Local 39, 2021 through 24 Collective Bargaining Agreement. In a discussion, roll call, please. Trustee Martin? Aye. Trustee Voice? Aye. Trustee Young? Aye. Trustee Thurston? Aye. Trustee Honeychurch? Aye. Trustee Cara? Aye. President Chapman? Aye. Student Trustee Teague? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12D, contract agreement with Arbor Environmental or Respirator Fit Testing Services. Uh, wait. Yes, thank you. Good evening, trustees. This is an agreement um, to do respiratory fit testing for our fire academy. Okay. Um, I would like to call on Trustee Karima. Would you be willing to pass, uh, make the motion for item 12D? I make the motion for item 12D. Uh, Trustee Thurston, would you second the motion? I second the motion. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Karima and second by Trustee Thurston to approve contract agreement with Auburn Environmental for respirator fit testing services. Discussion? Roll call. Please. Trustee Young? Aye. Trustee Thurston? Aye. Trustee Honeychurch? Aye. Trustee Martin. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Sorry. Boyce. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Trustee Cara. Aye. Student Trustee Teague. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12E, contract agreement with arts people for box office ticketing services provided by a Neon One company. Uh, this is the VP week again. I'm it thinking. is. Thank okay. you so much. Um, we're asking that the board approve this contract agreement with Arts People for box office ticketing. Um, we've gone through a lot of 
box office, box office ticketing and services in the, in the prior years. Um, the last contract that we had ended in March 2021. Um, due to COVID and not having any box office ticketing needs, um, we're looking to pass this one, um, which meets the needs of our theater department um, and any ticketing services. This is something that can be used across campus and not just for the theater. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Trustee Martin, can I get you to move for the approval of item 12E? I'll make a motion to approve 12E. Trustee Boyce, would you be willing to second the motion? I will second my motion. Thank you. It has been moved by Trustee Martin and second by Trustee Voice to approve the contract agreement with Arts People for box office ticketing services provided by a Neon One company. Any discussion? Roll call. Oh, just a minute, Trustee Martin. I have a question. Um, when we're selling, when they advertise tickets, will they be advertising for tickets? Say, how does how does that work? for the theater and for other events. Like how do they advertise for tickets? Yeah, yeah. how does that, how does that work? As far as um, it can be done in a multitude of ways. Um, it can be done with a, a link on social media platforms or on our webpage. Um, they have the ability to take credit card purchases at, um, at the event itself. Um, as well. So it doesn't all have to be online. It can be in person. So there's a multitude of ways that they can actually advertise for the tickets for this and use the service with this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions? Roll call, please. Trustee Thurston. Trustee Thurston. Trustee, I, I'm sorry. Trustee Young. Tr Trustee Voice. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. Aye. Trustee Cara. Aye. Student Trustee Teague. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Young. Motion does pass. Okay, thank you. Item 12F, Memorandum of Understanding with the City of Fairfield for Firearms Training Facility Use, uh, BP Week. Yes, thank you again. Um, this is an MOU with the city of Fairfield so that um, our sworn officers and anybody who is charged with carrying a weapon as part of our Department of Public Safety goes through training on a quarterly basis um, so that we stay up to the standards that we are setting for our department. Okay. Um, Trustee Karima, would you be willing to move for the approval? of item 12 F. Um, yes, I would like to move for the approval of 12 F. Uh, Trustee Honeychurch, would you be willing to second the motion? I second the motion. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Karima and second by Trustee Honeychurch to approve the Memorandum of Understanding with the City of Fairfield for, for uh, firearms training facility use. Uh, any questions, comments? Seeing none, hearing none, uh, roll call. Trustee Young? Aye. Trustee Thurston? Aye. Trustee Honeychurch? Aye. Trustee Martin? Aye. Trustee Voice? Aye. President Chapman? Aye. Trustee Cara? Aye. Student Trustee Teague? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12G, contract agreement with Automatic Records Management Systems for the Department of Public Safety Software Services and Records Management. Uh, VP Wheat. Yes, thank you. 
Um, we're asking that the board approve this contract agreement um, with a company that's called ARMS. It's spelled out here for you. Um, it's for the records management of our Department of Public Safety for um, things that are related to the Public Safety Department. It um, will be used in their vehicles and um, everywhere that they need to pull up a record on anybody. Um, it's part hosted on part of the government servers. Okay. Um, Trustee Young, would you be willing to move for the approval of item 12G? I move that we approve item 12G. Okay, Trustee Thurston, would you be willing to second the motion? I second item 12G. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Young and seconded by Trustee Thurston to approve the contract agreement with Automatic Records Management System for Department of Public Safety Software Services and Records Management. Uh, any discussion? Questions. Roll call, please. Trustee Honeychurch. Aye. Trustee Thurston. Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. Trustee Cara. Aye. Trustee Young. Aye. Student Trustee Teague. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Trustee Martin. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12H, Measure Q Bond Project Initiation, Central Plant Replacement Project. Biggie, biggie, biggie. Uh, Lucky Lawton, please. Uh, thank you, President Chapman, members of the board. Uh, this item that we're seeking board approval for is to approve the initiation of a project to replace our central plant equipment. Um, as you'll recall, we conducted a feasibility study on uh, significant uh, portions of our infrastructure related to our electrical systems, our heating and cooling systems, and our swimming pool. Of those studies that were conducted, these, this project is, some, is a project that we see tremendous value in moving forward with. Um, so if you have any questions, happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. Um, let's Trustee get the motion on the floor and then we'll have the discussion. Um, Trustee Martin, since you had your hand up, would you like to move for the approval of item uh, 12H? I'll make a motion to approve 12H. Trustee Honeychurch, would you be willing to second the motion? I, yes, I second the motion. Thank you. And now we will have discussion. And I believe Trustee Martin, you had your hand up. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, central plant replacement project. How old is that plant? And has it passed its useful life? So the central plant, well, the plant itself is, is original to the campus. The uh, equipment in the plant has been replaced some 20 plus years ago. I think it's a, a little over 20 years ago. So the chillers and boilers are, you know, of that vintage. And uh, is there some period of life left in them? Uh, yes, on the chiller side, we, we have had to add, uh, replace one of the chillers already, but chillers are a challenge. They, they can last for long periods of time. Uh, they can be rebuilt. Um, it's just, an expensive proposition. And since these cool the entire campus, they're significant in size. The boilers themselves are failing. Uh, we already have leaks in boiler tubes that we've been having contractors plug and, and we're, we're working very hard to try to, to keep these boilers lumping along, um, but they have reached the end of their life. Uh, boilers tend to be shorter lived than chillers. And the cooling tower, uh, which is part of this project, is also completely, completely used up. Also, they, they tend to be shorter lived. And the, um, are there going to be more energy efficient? Or do we have any idea? Or is that very much, very much so. Uh, the chillers themselves, the, uh, a new generation of chiller, uh, it is an oil, it's a fantastic 
piece of equipment. Uh, I've had the, the pleasure of working with these for uh, probably the past 15 years. These are magnetic levitation chillers. They actually lift the impellers into the into the air and spin them uh, with without any oil because they're held in the air magnetically. Um, they're frictionless. They are incredibly efficient, and they can unload. Um, which is to say they can produce a, a broader range of capacity from the, uh, which, which achieves a lower, they're very efficient at low end, which most chillers aren't of, of the vintage that we have. So yes, they will be significantly uh, cost effective. Um, and the plan with our boilers is to move away from um, natural gas. Uh, so this is, uh, will reduce our carbon footprint and will be a far more sustainable approach to how we heat the campus. We'll also be electrifying half of the boiler plant. So we'll be depending on our solar to power some of that. The study has provided enough information for us to understand what we can power and what we can't, which is why we're going 50-50, half electric, half natural gas. It would be great if we could go all electric, but we would have to double the size of our solar farm uh, or more because solar production in the winter is is far more challenging. I know this isn't a glamorous, but I'd sure like to see that when it's done. Oh, well, we can have a tour. I would love to set up a tour. <laughs> you know, it sounds fascinating beyond me, but it sounds very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Hey. Any further additional questions? If not, roll call, please. Trustee Young. Aye. Trustee Thurston. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. Aye. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Trustee Cara. Aye. Student Trustee Teague. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12, aye. Contract award to Stellis O'Brien for professional services for the Fairfield Campus Central Plant Replacement Project. Oh, lucky, you're lucky again. Yes, you're the lucky you. one. Go for it. <laughs> thank you, President Chapman. Uh, so the, the firm that we commissioned our study with is a, is a significant national engineering firm. Um, and we are proposing to award the contract for a design uh, this is for a central plant for a design bid build project. Uh, they have hundreds, if not thousands of these projects under their belt. They've been doing this for a long time. And we're using a design bid build approach with this firm because um, we, you know, this is, this is not an uncommon uh, system to replace. So they have tremendous experience and we believe this will be the most cost-effective approach to replacing the central plant. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And I'm going to call on, sorry. Yeah, uh, that's 12 I. I'm going to call on trustee voice. Would you be willing to move for the approval of 12 I? A motion for the approval of item 12 I. And Trustee Cara, would you like to second the motion? I'll second the motion. <laughs> Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Boyce and second by Trustee Cara to approve contract award <laughs> Alice O'Brien for professional services for, <coughs> for the Fairfield Campus Central Plant Replacement Project. Discussion. I have a few questions, I believe uh, I had sent to the president, superintendent president in regards to Stellis O'Brien. Yes, uh, I, I don't know if Mr. Lofton has had an opportunity to do the research as requested, so I will check so, in with him. Yeah, so there were two aspects to it and I did reach out to the firm. Uh, they will be sharing diversity information from the firm. Um, uh, I did speak with Carl, Carl, Mr. Salas, and um, 
Uh, he will do some research into gathering that information and sharing that information with us. Uh, we also, uh, through the bond, through our bond program, did some research on a structural engineering firm that they recently acquired. So, uh, and while that was in the news recently, none of our records reflect that that firm had done work on campus. It doesn't, so they're not in our system as a payee. They are not listed on any of our projects as the, as the prime engineering firm. That doesn't mean that they haven't done some consulting work for some of our other projects. So we were uh, trying to research some of our projects. If they were a sub-consultant to one of our large projects, uh, they may not have been listed in such a way that we could easily find that information out. I, I got that or I got those that inquiry today. So we've been working to find that information. Okay, Trustee, uh, the question that I was asking as a superintendent, um, it was this afternoon or late this morning that I sent a request for information. And it was in regards to um, a structural engineering firm, RHM, that had worked on the biotechnology project here in Vacaville with Solano Community College. And they had recently been acquired by, recently, maybe in the past year or two, by Celis O'Brien. So my question, uh, what, what, one of the questions I can recall was about uh, where, whether we had had any concerns during the time that they worked on the project. Uh, were, uh, were there overruns and... Oh. There was one other one I can't recall, but that's the, that, those were the questions that I sent to the superintendent uh, seeking additional information. Um, so with that, um, I guess we will be hearing more. And then I did add the question about the diversity of their workforce. According to information uh, on their website or in social media, they have a, a an uh, employee listing of about 655 employees or something like that. And I don't know if that included RHM, the acquisition of RHM. So I just wanted to know their composition, who they were, and whether or not we had had any past issues with the company that they just acquired to do another large pro uh, project. Okay, any questions? All right, transparency is very important. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hopefully we will receive that information from Lucky at another at a later date. Um, and I did put in there that uh, I think I did share with the superintendent that uh, the, it was impressing. I, I can't remember how I said it, but I was just seeking the information upon when it was convenient for them. So item 12I, uh, roll call. Trustee Cara. Aye. Trustee Thurston. Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. Aye. Trustee Young. Aye. Student Trustee Teague. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Trustee Martin. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item 12J, Measure Q Bond Project Initiation, replaced substation three and four. Uh, Lucky? Uh, thank you again, President Chapman. Uh, this, this is a project initiation approval for, from the board to begin the project to replace substations three and four. Um, as you know, we replaced substations one and two uh, a couple of years ago. These substations are 50 plus years old. They are original to the campus. They are part of our electrical infrastructure. Uh, it's a 12,000 volt system that feeds power to the entire campus. Um, and they have reached the end of their life. Um, so we, we, we hope to be able to have these replaced as quickly as possible, but we will be using a different strategy than we used with the first two. The, the first two resulted in a week-long shutdown. 
our plan is to reduce that shutdown for for hopefully you no know, more than one day, but at most two days. So uh, with your approval, we'll begin, we'll be able to begin this project. Okay, thank you. Uh, trust, Trustee Honeychurch, would you like to move for the approval of item 12J? Yes, I move approval of item 12J. And Trustee Young, would you like to move to second the, uh, the motion? J. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Honeychurch and second by Trustee June to approve the Measure Q bond project initiation, replacement substations three and four. Discussion? Roll call, please. Trustee Young? Aye. Trustee Thurston? Aye. Trustee Honeychurch? Aye. Trustee Martin? Aye. Trustee Voice? Aye. President Chapman? Aye. Trustee Cara? Aye. Student Trustee Teague? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12K, contract award to Celis O'Brien for professional services for the Fairfield Campus replacement substation three and four. Uh, Lucky, I think you probably say it all you need to say about <laughs> the substations, but go for it. Yeah, well, so this this um, item would be to award Salas O'Brien, the uh, firm that we commissioned for the study, uh, a contract to, to, to develop criteria documents for us to be able to bid a design build project for the substation replacements. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Thurston, would you like to make the motion to approve item 12K? I move that we approve item 12K. Trustee Martin, would you like to second that motion? Second. It was moved by Trustee Thurston and second by Trustee Martin to approve the contract award to Salas O'Brien for professional services for the Fairfield Campus Replacement Substations three and four project. Discussion? Roll call, please. President Chapman? Aye. Trustee Thurston? Aye. Trustee Voice? Aye. Trustee Honeychurch? Aye. Trustee Young? Aye. Student Trustee Teague? Aye. Trustee Cara? Aye. Trustee Martin? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12L, approval of contract change order number 19 to BHM Construction Inc. for the Fairfield Library Learning Resource Center project. Uh, Thank you again, President Chapman, members of the board. I, I know this, we've, we've been doing this library project for many, many years. And I know change order 19 is means that we're getting close to the end. We're actually probably at about 91% of the project being complete. So we have the last 9% of the project to go. This particular change order for 19 for uh, total $75,026. Some of it is CARES Act and that's $50,941. And 24,085 would be bond and state funds. Uh, if you have any specific questions about specific items, I'd be happy to speak to them. Okay. I just one we would finish with these change orders. Um, close, close. Okay, close, close. I'm going to let some, one of the trustees have fun with this one. Um, <laughs> Trustee Martin. Would you like oh. to move for the approval of item 12L? I'll make a motion to approve 12L. Hopefully. And Trustee Cara, would you be willing to second the motion? I'll second the motion. Thank you. Um, it was moved by Trustee Martin and seconded by Trustee Cara to approve the approval of contract change order number 19 to BHM Construction Incorporation, Incorporated for the Fairfield Library Learning Resource Center project. 
question, comment, discussion. Yes, trustee voice. I just wanted to say, you know, I, I appreciate that you're uh, taking in our our values, our resistance to change orders, and and and, and the way you report this with itemized understanding and really kind of working with our vendors to make sure that they know that this is a uh, you know we want to be really tight on these, and and so we we do see that reflected. So I, I appreciate all the effort. <laughs> Uh, Thank you, <laughs> the board is very clear. We're very clear. Huh? All right. Okay. Uh, no further discussion. Roll call. Trustee oh. Mark. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought I heard a voice. Okay. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Young. Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. Trustee Thurston. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. Hi. Trustee Cara. Trustee Cara. Aye. 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 Trustee Teague. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12M, contract amendment number three to Noel and Tam Architects for professional services for the Library Learning Resource Center project. Um, lucky. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, again, um, I'll just say we're we're in single digits uh, of left to go. We're we're nine percent to go. So uh, we're we're getting to the end of this. But yes, uh, we had some minor uh, changes and and uh, items that Nolan Tam, our architect of record, needed to address. Um, $35,460 of this amendment was CARES Act funds, only $4,744 is bond related. So again, CARES Act is definitely, or I should say COVID, has definitely had an impact on our library project. Yes, it did. Okay, um, with that, Trustee Young, would you be willing to move for the approval of item 12M? I move that we approve item 12. Trustee Thurston, would you be willing to second the motion? I second the uh, 12M. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Young and second by Thur Trustee Thurston to approve the contract amendment number three to Nolan Tam Architects for professional services for the Library Learning Resource Center project, Building 100 replacement. Um, discussion, comments? Seeing none, roll call, please. Trustee Thurston? Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. Trustee Young? Aye. Trustee Cara? Aye. Trustee Honeychurch? Aye. Trustee Martin? Aye. President Chapman? Aye. Student Trustee Teague? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12 in contract amendment. Number one to PMP Environmental Consulting Inc. for professional services for the Library Learning Resource Center building 100 replacement project. Oh, lucky. How lucky you are to be nearing the end of your, your section. Uh, uh, yes, this is the end for me. Um, but yes, uh, so this particular item uh, is due to a number of delays that we had uh, in terms of how we're addressing abatement within the, uh, within the old building. Our consultant that we hire that, that oversees the abatement for our protection um, needed to address the extension and the time schedule. And that's the purpose of this amendment. Okay, thank you. Trustee Honeychurch, would you like to move for the approval of item 12 in? Yes, I move approval of item 12 in. Trustee Martin, would you second the motion? I'll second that motion for 12 in. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Honeychurch and second by Trustee Martin to approve the contract amendment number one to PMP Environmental Consulting Inc. for professional services for the Library Learning Resource Center building 100 replacement project. Comments? Uh, 
Discussion? Comments for discussion, not discussion. Oh, none. Roll call. Trustee Yanni? Aye. Trustee Thurston? Aye. Trustee Honeychurch? Aye. Trustee Martin? Aye. Trustee Voice? Aye. President Chapman? Aye. Trustee Cara? Aye. Student Trustee Teague? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, in the academic affairs, item 12O, the Chancellor's Office Experiential and Work-Based Learning Grant Agreement. And we're going to hear from VP David Williams on this one. Uh, thank you, President Chapman. Thank you, Lucky Lofton, for ceding your time. Uh, <laughs> members of the board, we're uh, presenting to you an agreement uh, from uh, Chuck Eason. Uh, this, he's the... Uh, uh, Oh, the name keeps changing. Uh, not the sector navigator, he's the director uh, uh, from the chancellor's office. So this is part of, the, of an ongoing grant uh, supporting some uh, internship experiences for students in uh, bio entrepreneurship. So again, this is funding that will come to us that will be distributed to other campuses. Okay, happy to see it. Usually we approve Chuck's um, uh, let's see, I think we are his fiscal agent. We approve and then we don't hear from him, but we've been hearing from him more often this, uh, this year. He's, he's uh, doing good work. He's doing good work. Good. Happy to know that. All right, with that, um, Trustee Cara, would you be willing to move for the approval of item 12-0? I'll approve. I'll move for the approval of 12-0. And Trustee Voice, would you be willing to second the motion? I'll second that motion. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Cara and seconded by Trustee Voice to approve the Chancellor's Office Experiential and Work-Based Learning Grant Agreement. Questions? Roll call, please. Trustee Voice. What's that mean? Aye. Sorry. <laughs> Trustee Thurston. Aye. Trustee Cara. Aye. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. Aye. Trustee Young. Aye. Student Trustee T. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Trustee Martin. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12P. We're going completely through the alphabet, aren't we? Uh, item 12P, agreement between Archway Recovery Services and and Solano Community College for Psychology and Human Services and Social Work Internship. VP Williams. Thank you, uh, President Chapman, members of the board. Here's another uh, internship agreement for our human services and social work program and our psychology students, providing them internship experiences and addiction recovery. Very good. Okay, wonderful. We definitely need, if you've been paying attention to what's going on, around us, it's very sad, very sad. Okay, with that, uh, Trustee Thurston, would you move for the approval of item 12P? I move for approval of item 12P. And Trustee Young, would you second the motion? I second item 12P. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee First and then second by Trustee Young to approve the agreement between Archway Recovery Services Incorporated and Solano Community College with Psychology and Human Services and Social Work Internship. Discussion. Seeing none, roll call, please. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Young. Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. Trustee Thurston. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. Aye. Trustee Cara. Aye. Student Trustee Teague. Aye. Motion passed. Thank you. Item 12Q, City Labs Application Services License for Design Play. Design Tool for Canvas and You Do It Cloud. Yes, you do it. Good job. It looks like you do it. Uh, uh, trust, uh, trustee Chapman, members of the board, 
Uh, City Labs is a vendor that we're securing. Uh, they provide a product that integrates seamlessly with Canvas that is helps faculty uh, with more end user tools to help them better design their courses on Canvas. So this was uh, suggested and recommended by some faculty and this should be good support for them as they continue to improve our online offerings for our students. Wonderful, okay. With that, uh, Trustee Martin, would you be willing to make the motion to approve item 12Q? I'll make the motion to approve 12Q. Trustee Honeychurch, would you be willing to second item 12Q? Yes, I second the motion. It has been moved by Trustee Martin and seconded by Trustee Honeychurch to approve with City Labs Application Services license a Design Plus, Design Tools for Canvas and You Do It Cloud. Um, something that threw me off. Uh, forgive me for saying this aloud. 12Q, I called it, I read it as Sid D, C I D I is C I T I. One place is C I T I, the other is C I D I. Uh, it is city, it is C I D I. If okay. there's a C I T I, that's an error. I apologize. Okay, it's in the motion. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. Trustee Young. Aye. Trustee Thurston. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. Aye. Trustee Cara. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Student Trustee T. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12, Ara. We're going to hear from VP Shannon Cooper and 12 R is marching order graduation software contract. Thank you, President Chapman, uh, Board of Trustees and colleagues. The marching order contract is a graduation software that we'll be using. Think of this as a successive approximation to the goal of an in-person graduation next, next year. So we're getting there. So this software will uh, assist us in collecting RSVPs, um, guest information, um, also alumni information, creating a portal for students to upload uh, pictures and what they wanna say about um, graduating. And also it'll help us distribute and scan tickets for the 2022 graduation that will be a drive-through graduation. Okay, thank you. So, um, item 12 R, trustee voice, would you be willing to move the approval of 12 R? Yes, I'm uh, willing to make that motion for approval of 12 R. Thank you. And trustee Cara, would you be willing to second the motion? Yes, I'd be willing to second the motion. Thank you. It was moved by trustee Boyce and second by trustee Cara to approve the marching order graduation software contract. Uh, discussion? Yes, trustee Boyce. Yeah, oh, thank you. I, I think this is really interesting and kind of professionalizes our graduation a little bit, which is which is nice to see. Um, can, uh, can you explain what the uh, collection of alumni data is? I, is that like in sync with our uh, um, Educational Foundations Alumni Association? Well, this is because we're going to be including uh, graduates from 2019-20, so that's really the focus. I just always thought we, we, we try to capture our alumni kind of late sometimes, like it seems like we could <laughs> capture them before, before we lose them to uh, really be part of our alumni association. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, COVID really did a did us in this year without students, so we're playing yeah. catch up. But we're yeah, we're getting there, right? So drive through, and then next year will be uh, hopefully an in person graduation. Right. Okay. Thank you. No for, further comment. Uh, roll call. Trustee Young. Aye. Trustee Thurston. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. 
Aye. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Aye. Trustee Cara. Aye. Student Trustee T. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12 S, 2020 through 2023 amended timely MD contract. And again, is that going to be with uh, VP Shannon Cooper? Yes, thank you, President Chapman. It's me again. So this uh, this is an amended contract to reflect the updated headcount because we had to remove student groups that we weren't going to be serving are able to serve our um, incarcerated students and also duly enrolled students. So this reflects the new headcount. Okay. Uh, Trustee Young, would you be willing to move for the approval of item 12 S? I move that uh, we approve item 12 S. Uh, Trustee Thurston, would you be willing to second? I second that motion. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Young and second by Trustee Thurston to approve the 2023 amended timely MD contract. Discussion? Roll call, please. Trustee Honeychurch? Aye. Trustee Thurston? Aye. Trustee Voice? Aye. Trustee Cara? Aye. Trustee Young? Aye. Student Trustee Teague? Aye. President Chapman? Aye. Trustee Martin? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12T, resolution number 2122-28, proclaiming March 2022 as Women's History Month. Um, Trustee Cooper, is that you? Yes, I have three I have three items this evening. I think that's a new record for student uh, services. <laughs> yes, so this, um, as you stated, uh, President Chapman, this is the resolution to proclaim March 2022 as Women's History Month. And the theme will be providing healing, promoting hope. And our first presentation is tomorrow from one of our students, uh, Ms. Krishana Westbrook. So if you're able to attend, please do. It's uh, 2.30. Okay, what's that information sent out to us? Um, I can uh, make that happen, yes. Please do. Okay, we'll do. Trustee Chapman, the schedule is also posted on our homepage. Uh, oh, there's okay. a scroll at the top of our homepage on Women's History Month events, and you can find it there as well. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Is a presentation and, uh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, a presentation by a student. This, this, the first presentation is tomorrow by Krishana Westbrook. She's one of our, actually one of our STEM students. Will it be presented by Zoom? Oh, yes. It will be Zoom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. That's excellent. Good to know. Um, so, Trustee Martin, would you be willing to move for the approval of item 12T? Motion to approve 12T. Trustee Honeychurch, would you be willing to second item 12T? Yes, I'll second. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee Martin and seconded by Trustee Honeychurch to approve the resolution number 21-22-28 proclaiming March 2022 as Women's History Month. Discussion, comments? I'm proud to be the second on this motion. If you wanna join uh, Trustee Martin as the first, I, I, I don't mind. You wanna, no. you wanna a duel first? No, no, <laughs> I'm a history major, so I'm glad to be part of this. I know, I know, I'm messing with you. Thank you, I appreciate you. Uh, roll, roll call, please. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Young. Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. Okay, thank you. Trustee Thurston. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. Aye. Trustee Cara. Aye. Student Trustee Teague. 
Aye. Motion passes. Well, thank you. We almost made it through the entire alphabet. Amazing. Okay, item 13, board study session. Uh, Dr. Esrazito Noy, you have the mic. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I am pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Marcela Cuellar and her colleagues from UC Davis. Uh, you may recall uh, the board requested that we um, solicit data and do some research to find out um, the, where Latino students in our service area are looking to enroll for college. And um, tonight will be part one of this research. And I think Dr. Cuellar will explain sort of what we might expect in the coming months. So I would like to hand over this time now to Dr. Cuellar and her colleagues to share with us on their findings so far. Thank you so much, President Esposito Noy. Um, if it's okay, I'm, I'm going to share my screen with you so that you we can uh, share the slides that we shared with you um, um, uh, late last week. So just a second here, let me make sure. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So again, thank you so much for um, the invitation to come join you today and come share some of our preliminary findings on our study. And with me today, I'm honored to be uh, co-presenting with Dr. Sherry Reed, who is the Executive Director of the California Education Lab at UC Davis. I should introduce myself. I'm Marcella Cuellar, and I'm an Associate Professor in the School of Education at UC Davis as well. And Dr. Mikal Kurlander is also one of the contributors to this pro pro project, and she's a professor also at UC Davis in the School of Education and the Faculty Director of the California Education Lab and also of the Wheelhouse um, Center. And then we're also joined uh, uh, by Mayra Nunez Martinez, who's a third year PhD student also in our School of Education, interested in Latinx college, community college enrollment specifically. So our project is, is really focusing on how uh, Latinx students are choosing Solano College or not. And so we, today we're going to share with you some of our findings on some of the enrollment patterns in the county and then also uh, give you a preview of the next phase of our project moving forward. So with that, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll spend just a few minutes talking a little bit more about the background context to the study and what we're aiming to do as part of this project. And then I'm gonna shift it over or, or hand it off to Sherry who will share a little bit more about the preliminary analysis that we've used to kind of understand some of the Latinx enrollment patterns in the county and centering the community college enrollment patterns specifically. And then we'll transition again to talk about the research plan for the next phase where we're going to be actually surveying students and learning a little bit more about their perceptions and also interviewing students. And then we'll open it up to questions from the board and also suggestions if you have any as we move on to the next phases. So a little bit of background, there's a lot of information here that I don't think, um, I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here in terms of knowing some of this knowledge, but community colleges as we know in our state are a critical site of post-secondary access for many of our Latinx college students. And, and, and really the majority of our Latinx students when they go to college in our state, they are enrolling in our California community colleges. At the same time, we know that COVID-19 has had a real impact on not only California community college enrollment overall, but also for it's disproportionately impacted certain communities, Latinx students um, and their families specifically with a lot of the financial concerns that the pandemic has brought on, as well as uh, health concerns, direct health concerns from the pandemic. And so we know that there's been some declines in, in college enrollment and then specifically within this population as well. And so we, we really think that this is an opportune moment to understand how prospective students, Latinx students that are thinking about community college at this moment? How are they thinking about community college? How are they making their decisions about where they will enroll in community colleges? And I think that that's important in certain regions of our state where there are multiple options within a commutable distance for our students. And so I think in this way, uh, we hope that the information that we provide to Solano can hopefully provide some concrete recommendations for the enhanced outreach, recruitment, and retention of the Latinx population in your service region. 
So what do we know about how Latinx students choose community college? So we know in general, um, and, and research from our colleague, Dr. Kurlander, really highlights that once we control for a lot of background characteristics, including SES, uh, school quality and the, the, the educational goals the students have, Latinx students are still more likely to enroll in community colleges. This really is a prime site of access for them, as I mentioned. What we know is in terms of when they're making decisions about community college or enrollment is that personal and family reasons are a large part of it. Students are really drawn to enroll in colleges that are close to home or close to their work. And so we see that as a common theme in, in, in our understanding about why Latinx students choose to enroll in certain community colleges. We also know from research that Latinx students also share that the opinions of others also influence where they may enroll. And that includes their peers, as well as current and past students. So word of mouth will influence where students may choose to enroll. But there are also certain institutional characteristics that can also influence if students choose a particular community college. And this includes program offerings, how much or how transferable the courses are within a college to a four-year degree, how easy it is to actually enroll in a college. And, and, and a lot of this comes from whether that the information on a website is accessible, as well as how responsive staff may be to their questions as they're considering college enrollment. So uh, these are just some of the things that we know. And we're looking forward to understanding more about what this looks like specifically for Solano County's service region. So our study is part a two part study. On one part, we're going to use secondary data to understand, well, where are Solano County high school students enrolling in community college? And so we will be uh, capturing data from the graduating high school cohort of 2017, 2018, and 2019 in the, day, in the county and understanding, did students go to college? Where did they enroll in college? And where does Solano fit in that picture of, of these patterns? And then for the second phase, we are going to actually uh, collect data directly from those students that are in the process of thinking about enrolling in community college in the county, and as well as not only high school students, but also adult students, because there's a, a large population of adult learners who may also be thinking about Solano College as an option. And so we also wanna hear and learn from Latinx adult learners, what they're thinking about as they're making decisions about community college enrollment. And so on one end, we'll have a survey of students, of prospective students, and then follow that up with interviews to get a much clearer sense uh, from their thinking process. And I'll detail that in, in towards the latter part of our commentary today. So I'm going to uh, pass it off to Sherry now who will review our preliminary analysis from the 2019 cohort of high school students who graduated in a county and what their college enrollment patterns look like. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me uh, tonight. I'm excited to, I'm always excited to talk about data and share graphs. So I'm <laughs> um, just talk to you about that this evening. Um, I. Um, wanted to say before we get started to dig into the data um, that the data used in this analysis was provided to um, our team because of a, a research partnership, an agreement that we have with the California Department of Education. So we have um, a longstanding partnership with them, um, um, funded a lot by um, I Institute of Education Sciences, but also College Futures Foundation um, in, in the state to really understand college readiness and the transition between K-12 and post-secondary. So um, we're thankful to them to have access for the, with, of the data. I guess, Marcella, you're gonna have to advance the slides and guess when I'm ready. <laughs> um, so the data that we uh, leverage for um, this particular study um, is um, comes from two sources. The California Department of Education, we have student level data on the high school of graduation and then student demographic characteristics such as gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic disadvantage status and English learner status. And we're able to merge that data with data from the National Student Clearinghouse, which we also obtained from CDE separate data sets. And this data has um, student by term um, level information for college enrollment, um, including where students go and the type of um, post-secondary institution in which they enroll. And like Marcella said, 
We are focused on the 2018, 2019, or the 2019 high school graduates um, of public high schools in the state and in Solano County. Um, these students also participated in 11th grade um, standardized assessments in the prior year. And we limit right now our analysis to those who enrolled in college within the, fir the first 16 months of high school graduation. So um, fall following into you know, expected graduation in spring or early summer, um, that following fall, the spring semester after that, and then the second fall. And um, that's what we look at to look at in what we call immediate college enrollment. Go ahead. Um, okay, so here um, we're gonna set the context um, for um, looking at college enrollment patterns um, in Solano County by comparing those to what's happening statewide. And um, in all of the graphs that I'm gonna show you tonight, the colors will be the same. So once you orient yourself to these graphs, you'll be, um, be able to follow um, quite easily in the next several graphs that I show. So we used yellow to represent community college, um, um, all public California community colleges, blue for the CSU system, um, green for the UC system, red here are private colleges, both in-state and out-of-state and public out-of-state colleges. These are students who are outside the public um, college sector um, in California. And then the gray, which I think is really important, um, is the students who graduate high school but do not enroll in college immediately following their graduation. Um, so here you'll see that um, there's 31% um, of students statewide that don't go to college and 69% who do. And the, uh, a large portion of those who do go to college are in the California community college system, um, nearly 40%. And the patterns are pretty similar statewide and in Solano County. You will notice that in Solano County, fewer high school graduates attend college, um, but the distribution between community college and four-year colleges is pretty similar. Okay, in this uh, graph, then we look at the same college enrollment rates for counties within our region, allowing you to compare a uh, Solano County to those that are um, adjacent to you. Um, we see the highest rates of college going in Marin County at 83% and the lowest rates in, for high school graduates from Solano um, County High Schools at 62%. Yeah, I think, um, I, can you go back just, just to point out that um, the overall lower rate, this is really just important to note that um, Solano County um, the, has an overall lower rate of college enrollment, but it's driven primarily by the four-year college attendance. So um, you'll notice that the uh, proportion of high school graduates from Solano County high schools that um, go to community college is pretty similar to the surrounding counties or higher. So this lower rate is driven by four-year enrollment. Yeah, okay. Nah. <laughs> um, and this is the same graph, but instead of counties here, you see the school districts within Solano County um, and the highest rates at Benicia Unified um, and the lowest rates in Vallejo uh, City Unified um, excluding the county offices of ed. The uh, county office of ed has small, um, I would call boutique <laughs> high school programs for special needs um, students, either special education or those maybe in, involved with the um, court system. Go on. Um, this is the same graph, um, just oriented um, differently. And each one of these bars represents a high school within Solano County, a public high school within Solano County, and their college enrollment rates. And so here we don't identify the schools. Um, we can do that eventually, but our agreement with the Department of Ed at this time is to not identify schools, um, um, but we will get that permission. To the left of this graph, you see schools with really low college going rates, and um, those are predominantly students from those schools go to the community college system. Um, and these are schools that are associated with the County Office of Ed or um, programs that are serving high need students typically. And to the right of the graph, then you'll see um, schools with much higher um, college going rates. Okay, so in this next set of graphs, we're gonna look at uh, the college enrollment rates for subgroups of students. So we've already established um, that the college going rate across all of California is uh, 69% and 37% of those students are in community colleges. 
Um, and then here you'll see, we look at the college enrollment rates of socioeconomically disadvantaged students. Um, this um, indicator comes from the California Department of Education. It's a very crude measure, if you will, of socioeconomic status. Um, it's students who are qualified for free and reduced lunch in the K-12 system or whose parents have not completed high school. Um, so it's a very, very um, like, um, broad measure of socioeconomic status. But what you can see here is that students from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds attend college at lower rates than, the stu than all students um, in their cohort. And um, for Solano County, this rate is even lower. And then we look at English learners. Um, these are students who were identified as English learners at the time they took the 11th grade assessment. Um, so these students are currently still learning English um, and they attend uh, college at much lower rates again than um, all students statewide or all students in Solano County and even lower than those students who are considered socioeconomically disadvantaged. Um, just hold on here just for a minute, um, Marcella, before you go. Um, I think what's really important to see here is that there are 67% of English learners that are not going to college at all, but almost all of those who do um, end up in a community college, at least right immediately following high school. So there's probably opportunity here to be of service to the, the student um, population and student subgroup. Okay. Um, here we see college enrollment rates by student subgroups. Again, these student subgroups are based on students' um, reported race ethnicity um, on their school enrollment paperwork, and we group them into the five largest uh, uh, groups um, in order to have enough students to report on in the county level. Um, and so here we see that the highest rates of college enrollment are among Asian American Pacific Islander students. Um, and they um, are higher than the statewide and countywide rates, that subgroup. And the lowest rates are um, of college enrollment are Latinx youth. Um, and that trend um, is consistent um, both statewide and it, within Solano County. All right, we wanted to take, so getting to, I guess, more the purpose of this study to really understand the patterns, um, enrollment patterns of Latinx youth, we wanted to kind of, um, uh, disaggregate that subgroup of students by a couple of characteristics that we think are really important. So in this graph, we we're presenting um, college enrollment rates for Latinx students um, of, and female and male. So separating out students by gender. And here you'll notice that uh, female students um, are more likely to attend college than their male peers. Um, and it will be important for you to know that that uh, pattern is pretty persistent across all racial ethnic subgroups. Um, but we wanted here to show you because of the, the focus of this study, the Latinx youth. Um, I think the most um, astonishing number to me in this graph and probably you, you all as well, is that over half of Latino high school graduates do not go to college immediately following graduation. Um, so that's a, probably also um, an opportunity for, for, for work and service to the students. Okay, and then here is a subgroup of students who identify as Latinx and are also English learners. And you can see here that English learners, and, and we saw this in the previous couple, a couple slides ago, we saw this previously, that English learners really enroll in college at much lower rates. And um, Latinx English learners, um, here you can see are just much lower than their non-English learning um, Latinx peers. 73% of um, English learning Latinx students do not enroll in college. Um, I would probably just, probably important to note that in Solano County, um, I think like almost 80% of English learners are um, Latinx heritage. Okay. And then the final graph. Um, so this, I, this has a lot of caveats to it, but I'm sure this is um, really important information to you. So let me just start by saying this is a graph of the most frequently attended community colleges for high school students with, that graduate from high schools within Solano County. Um, and it captures uh, their 
first college of enrollment, right? That um, wasn't a four year. So among this group of students who show up in community colleges in the year after high school graduation, um, those students are most, the vast majority of them are going to Solano Community College. Um, the next highest um, attendance rate we see is in Napa Valley College, um, and then Diablo Valley College, um, and Sacramento City, and then, and so on. Um, this, I think um, when we were looking at this, um, one thing stood out. So the, the light blue bars are all of your um, public high school graduates in your county. Um, the dark blue bars are specific to the Latinx subgroup of students. And it, we thought it was interesting to see higher rates of um, attendance at Napa Valley and Woodland Community College um, by Latinx youth than their, um, their um, other race, racial um, ethnic mm -hmm. counterparts. Um, one more thing I should say is that this captures only one um, enrollment. So the way we've analyzed the data so far is they were taking students first enrollment or their highest enrollment. And we know that many students, especially those in community college, um, enroll across multiple colleges, right? So they're concurrently enrolled in multiple places. And so one of the next things that we want to do is to dig a little bit deeper into the students that are attending um, community college um, in Solano County and understand where they're co-enrolled um, because there's probably a percent of them that are going to Solano and Napa or Solano and Woodland. Okay, um, before I turn it back over to Marcella, should I open it up for data questions here or should we wait till the end? Oh, can you open it up now, please? I th yeah, I think it would be great if we could do the um, data questions before we dive into the more qualitative work. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, uh, Trustee Carr, you have a question at, at this yeah. time? I would love to ask, in, in that graph, the most frequently attended community college, could you explain that a bit more? Because um, what, what I heard you say was first enrollment but the students enroll multiple times. So what does that mean? Is it, I, I'm understanding that I'm a, I'm a high school graduate and I've applied at three different universities. It's just that I start off with Solana Community College. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, this data is messy, right? So, um, so we have, we have um, taken students, where do they show up first? And if they show up in multiple places during that first term, what's the fall following their high school graduation, we, we um, capture the highest level. So if they're taking like one class at, um, at Solano Community College, but most of, but, but they're enrolled full time at UC Davis, we would count them as a four year graduate. Um, so what so what you see here is the blue section of the right of or sorry the yellow section of the um, pie chart when we were looking at those percent of students that go from graduate from high school in Solano County and go to community college the 59 60 percent of them are going to Solano Community College um, so what the next step is is for us to understand students who are concurrently enrolled and say Sol Solano and UC Davis or Solano and Napa Valley, we're gonna get there, we're just not there yet. So correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying that out of the 60% of Latinx students who graduate high school and go to college, Solano Community College gets 60% of them? 60% of the student enrollments in that group are in Solano Community College, that's right. And they graduate with us. No, we don't have we don't observe graduation data. So, but they've attended at least one term. Term. Yep. In the first in their first year and a half out of high school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, going then some of the acronyms I didn't know. In your first sure. slide, you used SES. What does SES mean? I used SED, but I think that um Maybe Marcella used SES, um, okay. and when she was kind of doing the contact, like describing the context for this study, um, mm -hmm. and when we use SES, we're referring to socioeconomic status. Um, okay. And when and I use SED, 
SED, socioeconomically disadvantaged. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's SES a, means socioeconomic status. Stat. So that's the general, same thing. right? Just talking about um, um, people's um, really financial means, right? Socioeconomic yes. status. Um, SED is a term very specifically used by the California Department of Education to identify students who qualify for free and reduced lunch or do not have parents who've completed high school. But they're kind of interchangeably if we're focusing on, 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 on people with access to less financial resources. Is that about right? Yes, SED is. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, the other thing is the screen that said we couldn't know which schools produced the the university graduate yeah, the the kids who went to university and you said that we the the department of education asked you to leave those names out well we have a data sharing agreement with the department of education which has allowed us access to all of this this data and we get that data at the student level so we have individual students names birth dates and a lot of their educational records. And it's for research purposes only. And part of that data sharing agreement is that we will not share any information on student groups that are fewer than 15, right? So really small schools or small subgroups um, within schools. And one of the parts of that agreement is that we will not really out, if you will, schools because some of that's low performing and some are high performing and we're not, we're in the business of understanding research, right, what is and the why, and we're not in the business of trying to, you know, I don't know, condemn, right, or speak poorly of schools. Um, but often when we're involved in research projects like this one, where we're engaged with a community organization, if I could put you in that bucket for, for the time being, that is looked, um, aiming to improve, right, um, student outcomes, we get, once we produce the data and the analysis and the report, we get permission from the Department of Ed to name those schools. So I think it'll, it's coming, but I have to do the um, due diligence and get that permission from the Department of Ed. Okay, okay, thank you. Cause that would be, I mean, obviously that, that's where our focus should be is helping those schools that are having a hard time moving their kids from high school to college uh, okay. in some way. Okay. Um, right. Just sometimes uh, yes. that information gets misused by, you know, people, not, not you, I don't think, not this group, but I think sometimes um, it, the information gets misused, picked up by the media or picked up by, you know, an organization that misuses the information to hurt schools and students and teachers. And so we just, we just have to make sure that we follow the Department of Ed's guidance on that. Is there any way we can get copies of email copies of this this presentation? I, There's a really a lot there that yes. is hard to to pick up very easily, and um, it would be really nice to actually have an ability to read it again, look at it, and maybe send you some questions. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee voice. Uh, there. Thank you. Uh, firstly, hello, Professor Crayar. <laughs> I, had, I was a student in, in our class, so I just wanted to say hello. But uh, also, I, you know, I'm looking at this data. Um, I know that Napa Valley is a identified Hispanic serving institution. Institution at SI is Woodland also. I, I'm maybe I'm assuming. It would could we speculate that that might be part of the additional draw that there's a sort of a designation? Do we do we know that that that, that designation causes a draw or just sort of targets? you know, the services of students who already go there. Marcella, do you want to take That's that That's a great one? question. So, so we can speculate that it possibly could be part of what's happening. Um, we also know that um, students also like to enroll in community colleges that may be close to their work. And so we're also wondering if work is another factor here. Mm -hmm. If students are employed in, in industries that are near these community colleges, that might be another draw. But we also know that, um, and actually most of these colleges on the list are, are now HSIs, but that they, the, the extent to which they may um, um, convey that to students may be another way, right? The students may interpret that as like, oh, I see myself here. And so we do hope that as part of our next phase of study, we can kind of probe for that a little bit. Could you explain what HSI is? 
Great question. So HSI stands for Hispanic Serving Institution. And this is a federally recognized type of institution that's really defined by its Latinx enrollment at 25%, at least 25% of the undergraduate enrollment um, is identified as Latinx, and at least 50% of the population must also be low income. And so those institutions that have this designation are then eligible to compete for federal funds to create new programming to better support um, the educational outcomes of, of Latinx students and really all of the students that attend that college. Are we an HSI college? Not yet. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any additional questions. If you wanna move I'll, forward, great. I'll I'll ask one more question, if I may. What does it take to become an HSI college? That is a great question. So, so HSIs really are driven by enrollment, the definition. So, so once an institution hits that 25% Latinx enrollment, and there is like a 50% of, of the population is also low income, then an institution goes through a process through the federal government to be recognized. And so one of the things that many institutions do, and, and I would say, especially in California and in our region, and UC Davis is included in that, is we start to think about how can we enhance our recruitment efforts um, so that we do become a destination for students who, who um, enroll at our institution so that then we can hopefully start to better support students that are in the future gonna enroll at our institution as well as those that are currently at our institution. So I think a lot of things can be done intentionally, but it does take some time and effort. And we do hope that our efforts in our next phase of the project can provide you some thinking about how you may um, in Solano County and specifically Solano College, think about outreaching and recruiting those Latinx students. And I think that the part about um, all of these data that, that Sherry presented is that the data consistently illuminate areas for opportunity to better serve this population. A lot of a lot of the students may not even be enrolling in college at all. And so knowing that community college is one of those pathways or one of the large gateways seems to be a tremendous opportunity for, for serving um, these students um, more intentionally. And so, so in terms of the next phase of our study, that's what we want to do, is we actually want to understand, well, how are students in the Latinx students in the county perceiving and what are their perceptions of Solano College? Is this an environment that they feel is going to support them? What are, what, what are the opportunities that they see or what are the challenges that they may also see? So our next stage of data collection, we hope will provide some concrete recommendations. I also wanna briefly mention with the, with the quantitative data, um, this preliminary analysis that Sherry presented is the 2019 data. We will also have the 2018 and the 2017 cohorts so that we really kind of see the trends over over time and see if those trends are consistent. With these, this other phase of the project, we're going to be looking at prospective students and understanding their, their, their views of Solano. And so I'll just briefly go over this research plan for this part of the, of the project. So we are planning to do an online survey where we will outreach to students who are graduating high school seniors in Solano County, as well as Winters. And we're going to be understanding what are their motivations for college? What are their perceptions of Solano College specifically? What are the sources of, not, of information that they go to to think about college? And where, so where are they getting their not college information? And then from that, we will also ask a few, um, we will also ask students if they might be interested in being interviewed. And so from that, we will follow up with a subset of, of these uh, survey participants to also individually interview some of these prospective um, students to, uh, again, understand their motivations more deeply, understand a little bit more about their academic experiences um, in high school, as well as their work experiences. I think that's an important element to also explore. And then how are they making their decisions about um, where they, which community college they will enroll in? We will also, Ask them specifically, what are your suggestions 
about how colleges or a college like Solano can better recruit or provide information to prospective students. And then we will have incentives for participation so that we can hopefully encourage um, individuals to, to participate in this part of our project. We will disseminate this information largely through Wait, college. Can I, yes. I, I hate to interrupt you, but I see a trustee has a question. Trustee yes. Martin. Uh, we, thank you for this information. Um, what about the family dynamics? And uh, do you, are you gonna research into that a little bit, their thoughts? You know, I do have contact with a, a many of the families. I'm from the Winters area and we have a large population there. And uh, a lot of times it, the family might be a barrier to them going to college. And I've been able to talk some to come to college and they're so happy even, but, so I don't know if that's gonna be play into your research. That's a great question. Um, so we weren't thinking about the family as part of this project, but I think you're on to something very important that these decisions that Latinx students often make, they're not as an individual but really as part of a family unit. And so we do know from other research that we've done and, and, and Maida who's here is our, we're, we're wrapping up a study right now where we are, where we have talked to family and, and they are such a critical part of the decision-making. And so what I think we can do though is ask in these interviews, what role is your family playing in your decision-making and understand that a little bit more because I think that that can provide um, insight into how we, we can also maybe even think recruitment, not just for the individual student, but for the larger families and communities that they're coming from. Um, being that it can be a barrier, but we also know that for many Latinx students, the family is the motivation for, for college. So how can we kind of provide links there to, right. to kind of enhance college going? Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful question. But I think, yes, we can probe for family. And I think that's one of those important factors that's always critical in, in when we're thinking about Latinx students and college going. Because I know the family is very important to many of the families. And they, you know, the hierarchy of the family and the, the father and the mother have a great influence on all the kids in the family. So. Definitely. Def as well as gender dip expectations, right, for males and females that might differ in kind of the roles, right? So we will definitely probe for some of that and kind of hopefully provide a, a better picture of that with the students that we interview and, and hope that that can provide some insight for recommendations for how we can connect with the families more as well. Excellent. So I'll just mention really quickly here, we're going to largely be working with outreach programs since they are working directly with students oftentimes closely with their college decision-making. And so we've started to reach out to some of these folks to start building those relationships so that um, when we, we uh, get approval from IRB, we're ready to go to, to get our, our survey going. So um, here are just some of the parameters of, of the target population that we're aiming for. Students who self-identify as Latinx, that they reside in Solano County or Winters, and that they're either high school seniors currently or adult learners that are interested in enrolling in fall 2022 in a community college. For our interview sample, we are going to aim to, to interview at least 15 high school seniors as well as 15 adult learners and we'll get a subset of students who say that they're interested in Solano County, as well as some who say they're not interested, so that we can hopefully provide kind of a, a holistic view of how they're thinking about um, Solano specifically in this sense. And with that, we, we are planning to uh, provide recommendations for, for uh, you to kind of consider moving forward. And so here is just a timeline. Uh, so right now we are awaiting IRB approval and my hope is that we get that uh, approved in, in the next few days. Our plan is to disseminate our survey by the middle of this month. We will continue to examine the enrollment trends um, with the 2017 and 2018 cohorts, as well as some of the additional analysis with this 19 co um, 2019 cohort. And then we will move into um, data collection with the interviews in April as well as complete those interviews in May, analyze this data uh, uh, throughout the second half of May, and by the end of June, provide recommendations for outreach and recruitment. Yes. Uh, the sample, you only, you're showing 15. For the interviews. Yeah, that's not very many for a sample, is it? 
what we think what we're thinking that this is a good start for the qualitative sample so so that we can interview these students more closely and understand their decision making processes and then so 15 will be high school seniors and then another 15 will be adult learners so that we can hopefully see how these different populations are are thinking because areas are different with, between solano county in Vallejo, Fairfield, each one of them has their own dynamics. And when you're spreading it out pretty thin here to get, you know, when you look at the the large area we serve, does I to me it seems like a small sample, but I understand that this might be a beginning to a larger sample. Yes. And I think that that's something that we can definitely consider once we see the survey responses. If because we're hoping we get a, a large enough response, right, to be able to to kind of uh, pick the ideal group to, to interview. But if we find that we actually have several subgroups in there, then we can definitely look at uh, um, increasing that in interview size. Great. Thank you. Okay. And then, we, so we want to acknowledge again, the California Data Lab and all of the wonderful work that Sherry has um, done so far, as well as Maida, who's, who's behind the scenes right now. But we definitely want to continue to take questions or suggestions that you may have as we continue this project. This, this is Karima. Can I ask you a question that tags on to what uh, Trustee Martin said um, about the small survey number? Um, he made a very valid point is that our districts are very different. Fairfield is very different to Vallejo, for example, or Winters. And the needs of those students are very different and the education provided is exceptionally different. Um, is, for lack of a better word, can you please think about that? Because it would be nice for us to actually, we would do a better job as serving the kids that we are supposed to serve by understanding the dynamics locally. Another thing is, is that how much of the, the interest and will of going to college is a direct result of the help the student gets at the local high school, for example, in terms of all the, you know, and even the stuff that we provide local high schools, uh, the, the outreach that we do. It, all of that, I hope that you'll be paying attention to or, or dealing with, but thank you. This is just heart warm, warm, just, Terrific. Thank you so much for even doing this. And thank you, Celia, for getting this organized. And the question, yes. uh, I notice you have your contact information. If we have comments, uh, we can send those to you. You know, as I talk to the community members and I think the other trustees also, they may have questions that maybe you could answer in a, a follow-up uh, presentation. Definitely. Please uh, feel free to reach out to me and we will definitely, um, because I think one of the things that we also know um, um, is that uh, geography matters in terms of where students are choosing college, right? And so I think that what you're raising here is really like even within a county or a district, these ge geographic differences matter. And so we'll definitely take that into account as we start to see where students are where we're getting the responses from on the survey and think about how we can integrate that in, in our interview process. Excellent. Thank you, Mike, for mentioning that. Is, can we text that telephone number? <laughs> uh, great question. That's my office number. You can text mm -hmm. it. I do actually get an email if you okay. send it to me. Good. Good. Uh, so Good. please feel free to use either. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Marcella, uh, wonderful presentation. I want to uh, thank your team for coming out or being with us this evening, waiting to the end of our agenda to, to present this data. And from your presentation, um, I see it's going to be a mixed model. So um, with that, I think of the trustees when they were qu qu uh, questioning the sample size, that that is not the only group that's going to be interviewed. That's, that would be the quali uh, qualitative uh, information that you would be gathering from them. Yet a greater sample is, is included in the, in the study on the quantitative side. So I think, yeah. yeah but anyway. On the quantitative side, we observe all graduates from 
um, Solano County High Schools and, and neighboring county high schools for that, for that matter. We have the, the, pop, the full population, so. Okay. Definitely. All right. Um, any other comments, questions? Well, the data, beautiful, wonderful, great, very clear. Um, and I appreciate it because we had had um, a question earlier or a while back about uh, the demographics and who's being served. And I think, you know, when you receive data and it's very clear and concise and you, it tells the, the real, the true story, you actually see what's going on. And so anyway, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we thank you for your time today. And again, please do reach out to us if you have questions. And then Sandra, thank you as well for, for uh, getting us organized and having us here, everyone. Thank you. Okay, well, have a nice evening mm -hmm. as we continue along with our agenda. And the next item on the agenda, um, item 14, information items, no action required. Trustees, you have anything to share? I, I don't have anything to share really, but I wanna say, Celia, thank you and your staff, thank you so much for that presentation. That was, that was really very meaty and it's great to, to think about those things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And as trustee voice indicated, um, those are folks who are spending their lives doing research. And so it's, it's fortunate for us that they're so close by and could be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I would like to share one thing and we have a faculty member, I'm not gonna call them out uh, in the bio field. And uh, with school about to begin, um, he has about 10 open seats. He has reached out to his network, his social media network, um, highlighting you know, the program that's being offered here at the college. And he has 10 seats um, available. Um, that he's not here to see any student fail, but to help them to succeed. So not, don't be fearful of the math and science that's involved. And, and so who said, someone called a name out. Oh, okay. So anyway, I, I, I think that that's excellent that we have faculty members that are um, using their own um, network to encourage attendance. In the, in the various fields here at the college. So I just wanted to make mention of that. Um, so we will move on to item 15, announcements. I have one. You I have one? Pick, yes, I'll be picking up my crab. Uh, this, uh, what is it? Uh, this next, this Saturday, correct? Saturday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Saturday. If anybody doesn't want their crab, I'll be more than happy to take it off their hands and pick it up. Ha, 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 ha. So that means you didn't, that means you didn't buy enough if you're willing to take it off of somebody's hands. <laughs> you have to take your money for more. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got my order in as well. And I hope everyone else did as, as um, did also. Yes, I did too. I'm really looking forward to it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for mentioning that, Mike. I mean, Trustee Martin. Um, announcements, none. Items from the board. Anything else? Seeing no expression of. All right, no. So we're going to move straight on down to item 20. And with that, I'm going to call on Trustee Young to see if she would like to take action on item 20. I move that we adjourn this meeting. <laughs> uh, Trustee Honeychurch. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. I second the motion. Very good. Thank you. It's been moved by Trustee Young and second by Trustee Honeychurch to, uh, for this meeting to be adjourned. Um, Roll call, please. Trustee Cara. Aye. Trustee Voice. Aye. Trustee Young. Aye. Trustee Thurston. Aye. Trustee Honeychurch. Aye. Trustee Martin. Aye. President Chapman. Aye. Aye. Student Trustee T. Aye. 
Motion passes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm surprised I made it through this meeting. I, so anyway, everyone have a nice week. Uh, stay safe and um, see you the next time. See thank you. you. Take care. All right. Have a good crab and.